Chapter 1. The Sculptor's Shop. Rumours of Abundant Life. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time make them known. In wrath remember mercy. The Prayer of the Prophet Habakkuk. The first couple of rows at church that morning held a unique assortment of women. They whispered nervously to each other before the service started, obviously feeling a little out of place and probably wondering if they should have come in the first place. Not your typical church attendees, these women would likely be going from church to other darker environments, but they had come on this day to celebrate the baptism of one of their compatriots, Rebecca. She too had a sordid past, but today was a new beginning. My friend Catherine, on the other hand, had a past no one would be ashamed of. She grew up on a steady diet of Bible study and small group experiences, going to church every week. She was actively involved in the children's ministry and found great community in the student ministries. By the time she reached her 20s, however, she felt disillusioned. After two decades of throwing herself into the Christian subculture and trying to grow spiritually, her faith seemed stagnant. She sensed there was something more to following Jesus. In addition to this, the stories and accounts in the Bible read like science fiction to her in that she didn't see much evidence of their impact in her world. She knew she wasn't the only one who felt like this, but no one else seemed to care. Catherine was bored, uninspired, and disappointed with her faith experience. She was in a rut, so she started to search for something else. Catherine trained to become a professional makeup artist and began working in the modeling and entertainment industry in Chicago. This lifestyle was hip, fast-paced, and fascinating. She often worked with celebrities and influential icons in the fashion industry. Still, something was missing. One day, an older lady from church called and invited her to join a team headed to Costa Rica to serve women who were trying to break out of prostitution. They would train the Costa Rican women with alternative life and career skills so that they would have new options for employment. The woman explained that Catherine could teach them how to apply makeup in an attractive and subtle manner. Before she knew it, Catherine heard herself agreeing to the trip. During those three months in Costa Rica, Catherine encountered something she had never experienced. Loving, serving, and believing in these women was the most alive she had ever felt. It quickened her. She began to re-engage her faith and opened her heart to a whole new way of experiencing God. And when it came time to go home... She knew she could not simply return to the spiritual rut she was living in before the trip. Something in her had awakened. How, she wondered, could she continue this work stateside? When Catherine returned to Chicago, she did some research and began a most unusual way of serving women. At a strip club in the city, she worked backstage applying the women's makeup before they went out and performed. As she selflessly loved these women she started to build relationships with them. One day, she decided to offer sermons on CDs from our church. No pressure, she would just bring a box of CDs and set it backstage for anyone to borrow and then return for others to use. Several months went by, and one evening a stripper named Rebecca began to show interest in the CD box. She borrowed a couple of CDs and liked them. A week later, she asked if she could borrow the whole box. Sure, Catherine said. Rebecca listened to the entire box in a matter of days, and when she returned the box, Catherine asked if she wanted to attend church with her. Would I be allowed in? Rebecca asked. Of course you would. We would love to have you. When Rebecca came with Catherine to our church, I met them in the lobby, and we sat together at a table. So you're a pastor? Rebecca asked. Yeah, I am. She looked me right in the eye and asked, Do you know what I do? Yeah, I do. Catherine's trying to tell me that God loves people like me, people who um, do what I do. Tears welled up in her eyes, spilled over her long eyelashes and started running down her cheeks. It was hard to fight back the tears myself. Yes, Rebecca, God loves you deeply. How can this be, she asked. And then she started to tell me some of the horrible things people often say to her and shout at her while she works. I don't understand how God can love me. I don't even love myself. Rebecca, Jesus came to take away our sin and shame and replace it with grace and mercy. That is the good news. 
That is God's message. That day, Rebecca accepted God's forgiveness and opened her life to his irrational love. A few weeks later, I baptized her at our church. I will never forget the expression on her face. She glowed with joy and childlike delight. The first few rows of the auditorium were filled with strippers and other people from the club. They were cheering and shouting to support Rebecca's moment. Some of them were weeping, some of them were laughing and crying. I couldn't help but wonder what they were thinking as they watched our church embrace and love this woman, a stripper. I remember thinking this had to be a taste of the kingdom of God. Rebecca stopped stripping. Catherine ended up training her in the makeup profession, and together they continued to serve the other women. They even started to play Christian worship music backstage as the women were getting ready. In a place that was filled with depravity, exploitation, and pain, the rumors of the God of love started to circulate. When I asked Catherine how she would describe this experience, she replied, It was like coming to life. Coming to life. Don't we all want what Catherine experienced? Something deep in the human heart breaks at the thought of a life of mediocrity. Our hearts cry out for life, new life. In his classic work, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis used a striking metaphor to describe the Christian's experience of coming to life. He said, And that is precisely what Christianity is about. The world is a great sculptor's shop. We are the statues. And there's a rumor going around the shop that some of us are someday going to come to life. How would you describe your experience of faith? Perhaps to you, the life described in the scriptures feels more like a series of rumors than real life. Maybe you're stuck in a rut like Catherine. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Does that describe your experience? If not, you're not alone. In fact, many churches today are filled with people who might describe their faith as being cold as a statue, lifeless. Although Christianity is growing in places like South America, China, and India, this is not the case in the United States. In America, Christianity's growth and influence seems to be waning as non-religious has become the fastest growing religious category. You can almost feel the change happening. It's as if the Western church is on a fade-to-black trajectory. Society seems to be drifting further and further into secular humanism, and we, as Christians, feel powerless to do anything about it. Ironically, the culture grows increasingly more spiritual, while the church grows increasingly more practical. No wonder most Americans say they're not interested in Christianity. Not only do we seem to be missing a connection with the greater culture, we can't seem to find common ground within our own ranks. Church leaders love to tangle about their own subcultural debates. Liberal versus conservative, attractional versus incarnational, the city versus the suburbs, evangelism versus social justice, secularism, sexuality, consumerism, globalization, hell, heaven, and universalism, just to name a few. It seems as if Christians talk a lot about what we are doing or how we are doing it, but don't discuss why any of it even matters. Sometimes it feels like that scene in Titanic where the string quartet continues to play their instruments as the ship sinks. They make every effort to avoid sliding off their chairs while pretending not to notice the ship's going down. It seems like the future of the Western church is hanging in the balance. A rising hope. The prophet Habakkuk lived in a time when the future of God's people was also hanging in the balance. There was prevalent sin and judgment within God's people, a growing ungodly world power and uncertainty within God's rule. The prophet captured the why of his generation when he prayed, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk passionately verbalized the anguish of his time. He had heard the rumors of God's fame. 
caught rumblings of God's deeds, but would not stop until he experienced the reality of the transcendent power of God in his life. Habakkuk started to cry out for something he had never seen. The cry of his heart was to see an awakening of the fame and deeds of God in his day, in his time, in his generation. When we were teenagers, we experienced an awakening. We both grew up in a Christian tradition that was more defined by what you didn't do than by what you did. Christians prided themselves on abstaining from drinking, smoking, swearing, and dancing. This defined the Christian subculture. Growing up in South Australia, John and I met in our late teens when we both started attending the same church youth group. John had recently become a Christian, and I was discovering that God was not a series of religious rules and positive lifestyle principles. In fact, we were both captivated by an idea that was brand new to us. God's strategy for redemption on earth was to be carried out by the church. The very same sleepy, uninspiring institution that we painstakingly endured growing up was actually the community that was anointed and called by God. It was astounding that right under our noses was the most compelling vision, mission, and cause that we had ever heard. Captured by this new reality, John and I started to pray together. We would often get up early and pray in our church parking lot, in the city or on a hill overlooking the city, asking God to allow us to see the church become all he had called her to be. Independently, within six months of each other, John and I both moved to the United States to study and work. During the last 13 years, John and I have been on staff at seven different churches. Today, John is the senior pastor of Trinity Grace Church in New York City, a thriving, growing church with five neighborhood churches in the city. I'm a teaching pastor at Willow Creek Community Church, one of the largest megachurches in North America. We moved to the United States because we believed the church in the Western world would be worked out in America. Some would say we've ended up in diametrically opposed environments. A church planner in an urban context and a mega church teaching pastor in the suburbs? What do these guys have in common? Our response? 20 years of friendship, a mutual love for the church, and a desire to see the church reach her God-given potential. We are convinced we are living in a pivotal time in history. We want to see God do something truly historic in our day, in our time, in our generation. We wrote this book because the thought of our generation going to the grave without seeing the fame and deeds of God filling the pages of our own stories and the story of the world is untenable. We believe God is writing an epic, global, redemptive story that every single one of us have been invited into. We want to share our own experiences in life and ministry where we see people breaking free of spiritual ruts and coming to life just like Catherine. We hope that as you listen, you'll gain a clearer understanding of the cultural and spiritual obstacles the Western Church faces, and more important, how we can overcome them. Every day in our ministries, we see vivid signs of God's kingdom coming to earth. We pray God will ignite your hearts with the desires to see it in your life, in your church, and in your community. May we echo the prayer of Habakkuk and see the church rise up in our day and in our time. We are convinced that God has something fresh He wants to do, and we know that God rewards those who earnestly seek Him. We want to experience the kind of faith we've only read about and heard about. These are the stories of statues coming to life. The rumors are true.